Dan Whaley. <laughs> Thanks. Hopefully they've replaced most of that code that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in the spirit of problem statements, um, I think what we see as the opportunity here is really accelerating the metabolism of knowledge transfer. Um, and uh, we believe pretty passionately that in order to really bring this about, and this is a very old dream of many uh, people that have been looking to, in different ways to bring about this notion of a, of a um, you know, of a universal collaborative layer over, over the web, over knowledge, um, that uh, we need open systems, um, open standards, um, and, and coverage across um, all different uh, kinds of content and formats. Um, you know, this is um, a familiar article, um, not the article itself, but the fact that it is a, an article, um, you know, formatted in, in approximately this way, and it really dies basically at the point that it's published. Um, it's frozen in time, and as a reader here, you can only discover things that it cites, but you can't discover what cited it. You can't, um, you know, if there's an experiment that's characterized here, you couldn't uh, discover that some other researcher had come along and, and realized that if you, you know, turn the temperature up a little bit or you use a reagent from this company versus that company that you might get better results. Um, you know, all the kind of many layers of, of thinking and, and knowledge that might be related to this are completely unavailable to you. Um, you hope that you know, might Google or Google or somebody might um, serendipitously tell you of these things, but um, the, the opportunity is really extraordinary. Um, today we have uh, a solution um, uh, to bring <coughs> conversations to things called a comment widget. Um, it's, uh, we're all familiar with them. They're um, things that publishers put on pages that are kind of down there below the fold. Um, they're usually proprietary closed, or they're basically always proprietary closed source uh, systems that are not based on standards. Um, and they, the, the worst part about co the comment system is that it, it collapses all conversations into a single monolithic bucket. Um, and so there's no ability for different kinds of conversations to be going on at the same time, some public, some private, some personal. Um, it's really every, everybody's got to participate in the same conversation and the result is that it brings conversation down to the lowest common denominator instead of raising it to the highest common denominator. Um, it also means that because you've got to put them on pages that most of the web is silent. Um, there's no conversation happening there. Um, so, and not just on places like HTML, obviously, but if you were talking about PDFs or EPUBs or data files, um, there's basically no, no conversation happening over any document out on the web. Um, and so there is um, an old friend that we know uh, fondly called the annotation. Um, um, I won't say anything about it except that the benefit is that it brings things in context with precision, um, close to where um, the thing that's being talked about is. Um, and um, that is part of um, its really extraordinary power. Um, there are other annotation solutions that are out there now. Um, we know them, you know, the research gates and Mendeleys and so forth. Wonderful bits of innovation that have moved the ball forward, but what's coming is transformatively different than those systems um, because what we want to do is bring conversation to content, not bring con content to conversation. Um, and that's, that's the big change. So, the, um, I swear to God, it's visible on my laptop here. I wonder if it's just the nature of that. It's so bizarre. Okay, well, there's a really cool picture with some <laughs> layers of annotation there. Um, presumably, if I fast forward to another one, I may get my presentation back. Okay, well, um, so the key of that, the, there's a couple really important things that, the, that are enabled by the web annotation model. And when I talk about that, it's the thing that the W3C characterized uh, and standardized um, 
in, it didn't specify these cool properties, but these properties are derivative of, the, of, the, of its fundamental architecture, which is that there's a client which is brought to the content, and then there's a server, and the server serves the annotations to that client, which is you know, living in, in or around the page, being brought there by the browser, or being embedded or wrapped around the content in some way. And what that means is that there might, first of all, be multiple servers that have something to say about that content. So there's a, a notion of a potentially federated system. Um, and that those different layers of conversation might exist um, kind of side by side. Um, you might be able to kind of toggle between them and so forth. Um, so these aren't things that were stipulated by the data model, but they're things that are, that are made possible by the data model. So this. Um, uh, a lot of very passionate people. Bill gives me way too much credit. Um, the people were working on this um, standards effort way before I came to the picture, um, all the way back into the 90s with uh, the Anatea project and, and so forth. Um, and there's really a, a very large um, community of people that have been pouring their hearts out for a long time to pull this through um, the, the W3 standards process, first as a community group, later as a formal working group. and um, hooray, in uh, February of this year, it passed formal review, unanimous uh, ratification by members, which is um, quite unusual. And um, um, so that's really a transformative kind of um, period of time uh, or kind of moment in time for this um, system. Um, and it works um, potentially in all formats. The model is agnostic to format. Uh, and so people are building special purpose kind of data model selectors um, to be able to work in different formats like um, images and video and, and so forth. Um, we support um, HTML and PDF now, some tabular data. We're producing a, an EPUB integration with Redium.js right now, and we'll be working on uh, image and video support for our particular implementation um, shortly. So who are we? Um, Hypothesis is a nonprofit. Um, we be believe very strongly that for us to be as effective as we can at bringing this paradigm about, we've got to um, essentially pledge to be aligned <coughs> in perpetually with, to the extent possible, with users and partners um, that we're working with. Um, we're funded through grants from um, uh, foundations like the ones here. Uh, and um, we, our goal is to, is to create shared neutral infrastructure and software um, to create um, a best of breed open source implementation of this um, uh, of this standard uh, that that uh, people can rely on isn't that isn't going to be kind of sold off um, to you know, potentially a competitor. Um, also that that um, uh, groups can contribute implementations and integrations with which we can um, others can then benefit from um, and um, stewarded by an organization. Um, with a mission to, to stay aligned with folks for the long term. That should mean better functionality um, that evolves more rapidly at a lower cost, um, quicker to implement um, with insured kind of and pledged interoperability um, integrations with all kinds of, of wonderful things. People here may be thinking about annotation systems. There are many um, uh, of them uh, out there. Um, um, we um, invite you to make the choices that you do, um, but there are some questions that you might want to ask um, if you're in that process. Um, is it open source? Is it, does it um, uh, adhere to the standards? Could you run it on your own hardware if you wanted? So maybe somebody hosts it, but if you decided to change your mind later, could you just um, decide to, to implement it yourself? Um, is it permissively licensed, um, not just open source, but something that a, that a, a corporation could actually use? Um, you know, does it work to f can, it, can it do cross format in a anchoring between different uh, formats of a document? Um, is there a browser plugin so you could carry it around the web with you, uh, and so forth? Um, this is our team. We have 16 people, totally dedicated uh, on on annotation uh, as uh, technology and uh, as a project. Um, we run a server, um, which um, is starting to, the use of which is growing fairly considerable. Now we just passed a million uh, annotations in February and on pace for um, another couple million in, uh, by the end of the year. Um, very interestingly, uh, these numbers, um, only about 24% of the annotations that are made are public. Um, most annotations are that are made are either personal notes um, or 
uh, annotations that are made in private groups for classrooms, for journal clubs, um, all, all different kinds of use cases, some of which I'll talk about later. Um, so we're, our, our thinking is, you know, what is going to drive the next one billion annotations? Um, number one, those aren't all going to be running on our server. They're going to be running on lots of servers. The reason why the web beat AOL is because you can download the web server and run it on your own hardware. And it, it's a system, it's an ecosystem, and nobody controls it. Um, we think publishers are going to start adopting this um, at scale. We know that because we're having lots of conversations with them. Um, scholarly platforms uh, uh, and, and other kinds of tool chains, expert communities, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, end users. Also machine uh, generated annotations are a huge um, uh, kind of growing opportunity, I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, uh, Bill mentioned the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition, so in, in uh, December of 2015, uh, we started, we were having so many of these conversations with different publishers about should we implement annotation? We said, why don't we put a coalition together to let people share their experiences, um, their questions, their use cases, um, the experiments that they're doing internally, um, because what our goal is collectively is interoperable infrastructure that works everywhere. So that the, you know, the, the canonical user story is, as a researcher, I want to bring my tool to your content. Um, and I want to be able to take my personal notes on your content, bring my journal club to your content. Um, I don't want the annotation system that you've implemented to interfere um, with that. I wanted to enable that. Um, and so um, let the tool chain that you're building be my agent instead of your agent. Um, we also run uh, a conference called I Annotate, which was just a couple weeks ago. This is uh, now our fifth year um, to bring all different folks from uh, people building annotation technologies to people using them and so forth. So we spend a lot of time uh, on community building. So how is it being used? Um, lots of different ways, but I've, I tried to pull some, some, some of my favorite examples. Number one, straight post-publication discussion. Um, so here's a journal, uh, an article at Archive, uh, and a researcher has um, that was cited in this particular article says, hey, great, I, I appreciate the credit, but you know, you might also actually want to cite these other guys who are doing great work too. So um, you might not know that. Um, if you were deep into the field, you might go, have, that might have been a thought balloon over your head, but the young researcher um, just coming to the field might not know that and would be thankful for this very helpful and informative um, annotation. And here, Howe's also made another note and, and somebody else re replied to them. So there's a whole potential for post-publication conversation that's happening um, now at, at some considerable scale. Also, um, uh, researchers starting to annotate their own articles. So um, Alyssa here has um, um, pointed out that this project has now been renamed to Gene Weaver and goes on to describe um, what's happened since the article was written um, in some actual substantial detail. Uh, and so um, this is a great way for um, not just the article to be alive because other people are contributing to it, but because time is moving forward for the author too and they have lots to say about the things that they've done before. Um, now uh, publishers are starting to implement their own layers over the conversation. So one of the things that we heard the most is, hey, this is great, but um, when Readers come to our content, they should see our layers first. We want to run one of these layers. We want to get authors to contribute um, their own notes pre-publication that kind of are a, a gloss and an enhancement of the article. Um, we want to invite uh, community peer, peers of the author to place the, the research in context um, and, and uh, to kind of um, link it to other things in a way that the that is um, um, helpful because it's other people talking about the article instead of the, the author talking about it. And, but we want those to be in our own layers so that we can moderate them, we have full control over them, and so that when you come to the article, um, those are the default layers. In fact, you wouldn't see any of these other layers unless you had subscribed to them. Um, the bottom uh, is uh, example is one that we think is really interesting, which is 
that you know corporations and companies ought to be able to run these annotation servers behind their own firewalls, so that the researchers you know working on this preclinical drug at Novartis that's extremely confidential, um, it, but which relates to a, a world of research that's out there on all kinds of uh, you know major publications, can run their own groups describing those, you know, that the context of the, the context of the research that they're doing at the same time that they can simultaneously be aware of and benefiting from other public conversations that are happening. So this is one of the most powerful um, things that you get from this kind of an open federated model. Peer review, um, eJournal Press has now uh, integrated Hypothesis into their platform. Uh, we're talking with some of the other submission systems uh, so that you can do uh, your review with annotations, um, which is cool because instead of you know having to say, oh, it was on page two, line three, you can actually just do it via an annotation, uh, and then the author can re reply in line, and, it, and it, it's very interesting. So American Geo Geophysical Union is now testing this with three journals. Um, they just turned it on uh, in the last three or four weeks, and we're really interested to get the feedback on that um, and see uh, um, what the benefits are. Uh, cool, there are some really cool uh, an automated annotation um, uh, projects, one called Cybot, which is a project of the Neuroscience Information Framework at the University of California, uh, San Diego. And it basically, they've created a, a unique identifier, kind of like a DOI, but for um, objects like reagents, um, species, <coughs> things that are cited in papers and to which the specific of who manufactured um, that particular thing. So in this case, the uh, RRID of AB22156 is an antibody um, that was um, made by molecular probes and you know you can click through to the tear sheet on it um, and because it really matters which antibody you use in order to get the results that you want. So previously they weren't even specifying them in enough detail. Now the RRIDs let them be specified and with annotations, instead of copying and pasting that into Google or something, you can just click on it um, and see that information in context. And because they're all tagged, um, you can pivot and you can see all the other um, papers that used that same um, antibody just with one click. Um, so there's some really cool search and, and um, uh, other kinds of things that you can do when you use uh, automated um, annotations. Um, uh, Syracuse Qualitative Data Repository has a great project now. Um, they call it um, uh, ATI, Annotation for Transparent Inquiry. It basically, it's an illuminated footnote. So um, they've, they store all these documents in their data repository that are the basis, the evidence for um, uh, social sciences papers that are submitted. And um, they want to bring those um, documents, that kind of evidence, forward into the body of the paper kind of as its own layer. So now all QDR um, documents will be um, able to be viewed as annotations on their, um, on their source documents. Um, so in you, when you click on the thumbnail, you go straight to the, um, to the, the actual uh, image uh, or the PDF of that um, newspaper article. Uh, and we're also looking at being able to not only go to, the, to that document, but just scroll down within the, the target document to the actual place that was related um, to this thing. So it's kind of um, targeted in, in two different ways. This is a very cool project. Um, and you know, fundamentally, annotations are a, pot a potentially not just post-publication user-generated content, but content that publishers can use to enhance their publications, to differentiate themselves from, um, from others, and, and there's all different kinds of use cases that, that um, are enabled there. Uh, journal clubs, um, so we have uh, uh, folks that are creating uh, journal clubs um, so that they can um, take these annotations and to put them in, a, in their own group and have the different kinds of conversations than they might have um, when they're having talking publicly. Um, we're also teaching is another big use case. So teachers are um, teaching over texts, um, again, making groups, uh, inviting students into a group, especially for a class, and uh, 
um, using indentation to kind of flip the classroom. Uh, we have a, a, an alpha app for Canvas, and we're looking to make uh, apps to shim this open annotation layer into different LMS systems as a way to bring it to more and more um, of the surface area of content out there. Um, another uh, very interesting um, application is not just inwardly focused in um, the scholarly world um, inside of itself, but also outwardly focused, leveraging the expertise in the, uh, of scholars and experts um, in the public interest. So the question we have is, what if the combined expert, uh, expertise of professionals globally was available um, as a living resource um, over, over the web? And, you know, because when you think about things like fact checkers like Snopes and PolitiFact and so forth, it's a very, very small community. But if you were able to bring this kind of tool set to um, the world's um, professional communities, then you're talking about an extraordinarily large um, group of people who arguably are are probably have much more credibility to bring uh, to the things that they're seeing. Um, there is a group now called Climate Feedback that is doing this. Um, they have um, about 180 of the world's top climate scientists. Um, they're now annotating many times a week um, key articles about climate that cite uh, factual information, and um, they're correcting them. Um, so. Uh, and in detail and citing line by line the specific scholarly article that, that maybe um, contradicts the, the fact that was used a lot. And oftentimes, it is actually the researcher that wrote the paper that is doing the annotation that carries a tremendous amount of authority. And um, newspapers are now correcting um, their articles after they've basically been fact-checked by these communities, um, and um, the, which is starting to happen more and more um, because they they're becoming aware through Facebook and Twitter and other ways that this, what's ha just happened is socialized, that this kind of level of scrutiny has been applied. So we're very interested in saying, okay, climate feedback is an interesting example. What are the next 100 most extraordinary communities that you might be able to bring um, this to all different kinds of things in, um, you know, social sciences, uh, um, hard sciences, uh, civic um, areas of, of interest, um, and you, know, you guys can obviously imagine that. Um, so we'll be, um, this year, this is one of the things that we're most focused on is to launch, um, f help those communities that already exist take advantage of these tools and bring their selves um, and in inhabit their own space over the web. Uh, so let me do a little demo. Um, of what this looks like in practice. Um, so I will um, went and found a, just a kind of a random journal here. This happens to have some open access content. Uh, journal of Cell Biology, which is a Rockefeller University imprint. So if I go to um, the article, um, I can, they could embed um, this annotation capability natively on the page and um, um, many journals are, uh, uh, MIT uh, Presses, Cognet just uh, did an implementation over the weekend. Um, or um, I could bring the annotation capability to the page um, just by uh, using the browser extension. Um, and um, I could come down here and make an annotation over some text and um, uh, say something. Uh, oops. Um, insightful. Um, so that's a that's an annotation. It's now stuck there. Um, I can I can grab the URL to this annotation and tweet it out or link it in a page. It doesn't matter if the person has the browser extension or not. Um, they uh, it will just uh, you know if they don't we'll proxy the the technology onto the page on the fly, um, scroll them to the particular annotation, uh, and um, so that they can that the annotation is visible to the, to whoever they want to share it with. Um, so I'll delete that since that's a public note. Um, but that was in the public layer. So what if I wanted to in a, instead um, make a group? 
So let's say that um, uh, um, cellular club, I uh, want to make a group, it just takes a few seconds. So now I've got a group. Um, there's no annotations in there yet, um, but I can, if there's a URL, I can invite people to it um, and, and very quickly start to um, uh, have, create an annotating community. So if I go back um, here, I can uh, go to this um, cellular club um, and make an annotation here. Um, and let's see, you know, maybe there's a math equation that I want to drop in uh, so that we can support uh, uh, math, M, uh, math ML and uh, LaTeX and bodies. And I can add some tags here. So math um, cells and create that annotation. Oops. Um, and uh, somebody else could come along and reply, so it supports threaded conversations. So no, I don't think so. Uh, and you can have as many nested replies as you want. Um, if I in a reply to somebody's annotation, they get an email to, so that they can understand that that conversation has, has happened. Um, and this um, conversation can be happening simultaneously on the HTML and the PDF version of the document. So if I, um, let's see, let's let me go to the PDF version of the document and turn on the annotation layer there. There's, there's, my, uh, there's my annotation um, on that document and the reply. Um, and now I'm accumulating annotations in this group. Um, uh, this group um, it, uh, contains um, one annotation. And now as I continue to go and annotate, not just on that journal, but on other places, um, I um, will continue to add annotations um, here. So let's say I want to go to a CSV file. So this is just a, um, a file, CSV file of data on the web. It looks like CSV files do, which is kind of like that. But if we just run it through a viewer and add the annotation client to it, um, I can now annotate um, this cell of this particular data file. Um, and in fact, I can do it in my cellular club. So um, this, this group structure that I'm creating can now span across different kinds of documents in different places, different formats, um, but with one unifying kind of social collaborative layer, not just from the hypothesis server, but from any server that's, um, that's running that I've invited um, into my annotation client. Um, so I can add a data tag cells, post that to my cellular club, and then go back and reload this evolving um, uh, group uh, conversation stream that I'm accumulating here on these documents. Um, so I've got a data file and a PDF and uh, HTML and, and, and so forth. Um, so uh, and I can also search by tag. So here are the tags that I've accumulated. I can click on one and add as a facet to the, to the group stream um, and, and narrow the search um, by tags, by users, um, et cetera. I can do free text searches. So if I want to go and just search through the 1.4 you know, million annotations and search for things that have an, people have annotated about Trump, um, then I'll get you know, a large number of annotations, probably some quite recently, and uh, see what those people have to say. I can go go there, um, uh, kind of get transported to that particular article, uh, and um, see what that person was saying about this, less tweeting, something or other, about tweeting Trump. 
not surprisingly. Um, or I can make an annotation of my own. I could make it in the cellular club on this article. You know, maybe it was about something related to um, cells. And this is in my own private group, so I can create junk and um, not worry about having to clean it up. And so that would accumulate into this group that I've, I've created. So, um, so those are some of the basic um, capabilities of uh, the annotation client. Um, it supports rich media. Um, so I could not only annotate with uh, uh, math and um, text, but also with, for instance, a YouTube video here. So I could drop a, um, a video in there and play it right in the annotation body, etc. So um, those are some basic things. We're now working um, to also bring the same capability to EPUBs. Um, so we formed a partnership with NYU Press um, and um, the Redium Foundation uh, and also a, a, a company called Evident Point that has some of the um, lead uh, Redium JS core committers um, that are uh, software developers. And so this is a very early demo. It's not fully complete. It's going to take about another uh, four or five weeks to, to fully finish it. But this is a book um, about EPUBs, um, which is in the Redium reader. Um, and um, the annotation client um, is there uh, on the side. Uh, so if I sign in, I think I have to use Heather's account. Um, then I can. Uh, I can make annotations um, on this EPUB, and you know they they um, anchor to the same part uh, to the text, and I can direct link back to that particular text. Um, I could use group the same group structures, um, so I could if I, this was actually running on a on a server, not a demo server, I'd be able to you know go to my cellular um, uh, club and annotate there on this on this EPUB. So uh, the, this will ship um, with the Redium JS integration, but also simultaneously Fred Chasen from the EPUB JS project is working with us to bring the same capability to that. Um, so we'll have the two kind of primary uh, EPUB um, platform, web platforms that will be web annotation capable inside of the next two months. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, um, I th also, sh I showed you the, the group layers. This is the thing, the most recent thing that we've just uh, enabled um, is the ability for groups to run. This is their journal. They're running their own layer over their own journal. It's got their branding uh, little icon there. Uh, we also support um, the uh, private namespaces now. So if they have their own authentication system, they don't want people to have to have hypothesis addresses. Um, they can connect that so people can just start annotating within the, the user context of, um, of that uh, particular journal. Uh, and um, if they're not signed in to any other annotation service, whether it's Hypothesis or some uh, annotation server behind a firewall somewhere, they don't see any of the other layers um, until that user elects to sign in to some other service and bring those other voices to that page. So this was kind of how do we address this tension, right, where users want to be able to do whatever they want um, and bring whatever kind of community and voice and conversation they want to a page, but the publishers are like, no, 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 we want to, you know, that's reflection on our publication, um, and, you know, if there's poor quality com commenting and conversation, that, then I'm embedding that, then I'm essentially lowering, you know, the, the quality of my, what I'm publishing. Um, and so we wanted to essentially address that tension by, by letting both sides have agency um, in that process and negotiate this kind of, um, uh, you know, what's there by default versus what I invite um, um, to that page later. So um, this is stuff that we've just uh, launched actually for uh, eLife. Um, Paul's uh, in the back of the room there, and which uh, they'll be rolling out shortly. And uh, it allows um, uh, you to you know, do all the same things that you would do with a hypothesis client, but within um, the group layers that are uh, embedded and brought to that article by the publisher, where the publisher is. Um, and like you kind of saw before, um, if um, that person is, is logged into another annotation service, then 
all of a sudden you'd see uh, any groups that have annotations um, on that particular document there as well. And you could switch between them, annotate in either uh, one of those um, uh, uh, um, layers, assuming that you have write privileges to them as opposed to just read privileges. Uh, and I think that's, that's about it. Great. Any questions? Thank you. About this sort of thing. This is fabulous. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, but I want to ask some of the hard questions. Um, you are initially funded by grants, or do you have any kind of long term sustainability framework? Yeah, we are. Uh, our model is to, as a nonprofit, to sustain ourselves through earned income, a revenue stream from publishers um, primarily oh, okay. um, who want to implement um, their own layers over their publications. Okay. Um, so we have kind of a members model. Um, you know, if you want to accelerate the development of certain kinds of features, then um, you know, pay for that. Um, but it's then contributed back as open source to mm -hmm. everybody else. So you may pay to accelerate things, but you've also benefited from, um, from the acceleration of features that from people who have come before you, like the Redium JS integration that NYU Press funded through uh, as an earned income revenue stream to us, but but through a grant from Mellon. So it's a variety of different ways that the money uh, might flow. Is something that they wanted to prioritize because they're about to to um, launch um, a whole new set of uh, EPUBs, but and they want to bring conversation capabilities to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but now everybody gets to benefit from that as, as soon as we implement it for them, we'll make it available for okay. everybody else. Um, so we, you know, our model is there's a company that is the parent of the WordPress um, project called Automatic. Um, so WordPress powers 25% of the world's yeah. web pages. Right. It's all open source. You can download it, run it on your own server, never pay them a dime. Um, but if you want, they'll host it for you. Um, and they do that for about two to four percent of WordPress instances, mm -hmm. and you know the company is 800 people in it, and you know is, operates at scale and um, and maintains the WordPress project and so forth. For, so for us, that's kind of a model. We assume that if annotations as a paradigm are going to come to the web, they're going to have to come on you know thousands, if not millions, of servers for all different kinds of purposes. Um, we may host a portion of those um, to help sustain the project. Cool. Um, good. Um, uh, legal issues, libel, lies, alt-right, liars, spam, promotion, kittens, porn. Um, how do you deal with the bad actors in a public, if any, anybody can set up a server and have that be part of the public discourse? I mean, I'm, it's, it's all well and good to rely on active engagement and editorial oversight and that sort of thing, but um, that takes time, that takes money. Mm -hmm. It can be overwhelmed by bad actors. Um, uh, we've seen it happen time and time again. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've thought about that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, we've not only thought about it, but actually the last two I annotates, we um, led um, panel discussions on lots of different aspects of that question. But the fundamental answer is that anybody can right now can run a server on the web um, that has the worst kind of stuff on it. Um, and if you've got a browser, you can go there and you can look at it. But that's your election to do so. So if you come to a page and you choose to invite um, an annotation server into your browser and you choose to pay attention to all the nasty things that that annotation server has to say, then that's your choice. Um, and you know, from for the server that we run, we have very strict community guidelines. We moderate um, any anything that's even close. Um, to, to borderline, uh, and you know our goal is to run a high quality, um, you know, discussion and to serve, you know, we think you know a higher kind of, you know, more scholarly, more thoughtful, knowledgeable, you know, kind of discourse. But the beauty of the model is that we're creating infrastructure that people can use for whatever they want to do. Um, you know, it's a conversation browser, and you can browse whatever kind of conversations you want. It's basically, like the web. Like the web.
My name, is, my name is Cynthia, and I'm uh, from Authors and Editors. I have a question about um, what happens to the original? What happens, I mean, if you start attaching all of this conversation to an original, I know in science we, we tend to go back to the original and then go forward and then go back and forward. And what happens when an author wants to move forward and this living entity keeps on living. I mean, can you close it? Can you put second edition? Can you archive it? What can you do to allow growth? Because, I mean, just maintaining a Facebook page, for example, is cumbersome and time consuming. So what is this going to do to the authors and the publishers in terms of moving forward? Well, you could mean that in a lot of different ways. So let's maybe look at a few examples. like. Let's say that it's an archive, starts an, as an archive preprint, and then it's published later. So it's um, not exactly the same article. Maybe they made some recommendations and some, um, uh, some updates were made. And then a lot of times in archives, there will be a second version um, of the article, which, which has its own unique um, URL. Um, and then later, maybe it's that second edition, which more or less is the thing that gets published later, officially published um, you know, in, in a journal. Um, An archive maintains r links to the DOIs and to the final published um, URLs of, of anything to the best of their ability to, to, to um, understand that. Um, associations between those two things. So using those data sets, we can associate two articles, if it makes sense to. Um, so that the annotations on one, on the preprint version, perhaps, will carry forward into the published version. Um, so that could, you could perceive that to be a positive thing. Um, you know, the way you characterize the question, it seems like you wondering if, if that... Um, I'm wondering if it's going to get so cumbersome that the argument in the annotation is going to overpower the data and the arguments that are presented in the article, because that often happens when things move beyond. And I mean, is there a way, and then who who is in charge of that? I mean, is it the author's prerogative to say done? Or yeah. do the publishers do it? Do they withdraw it? I mean, what happens right. over so time? Right, th so this is kind of where the value of the different layers comes in place. Okay. So if the publisher and, you know, the publisher as the agent of the author, decides that on the official layers that are maybe packaged together with the article that they want to close off, you know, new annotations and, and kind of, you know, wrap it up and, you know, the, the conversations that were happening past a certain point weren't that useful, they can do so. But as a user, um, I have my own agency. I can come to that article and continue to have discussions on it, just like I could continue to tweet about it. Um, or continue to blog about it and continue to have my own conversation. You know, and as a user, I can choose to turn off if I find that too distracting. You know, there's a little button there, the little eye lets me turn off the annotation so I don't have to be you know, distracted by that and just live in the purity of the, of the original article. So I, I guess the answer is choice. You know, people have, this gives them a capability to listen to conversations that they wouldn't otherwise be avail have available to them but they also have the ability to turn it off and not pay attention to it if they don't want to. Okay, thanks. More questions? Well, we've got 12 minutes uh, to spare, so you can hit the beer 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much.